Our scripture reading this morning is from Esther chapter 4, verses 4 through 17, which can be found on page 491 in the Pew Bibles. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her, and he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned by the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will rise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendant will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of this word. Amen. So far, we've spent all of 2020 talking about calling, what it looks like to answer, God, to, to answer God's call, what it means to be called by God, how our hearing and answering of God's call in our lives impacts our faith communities and the world around us. You've heard me talk about how God calls individual people, and how God calls churches, and how God is calling us now. Then you had a chance to hear from two of our most faithful servants, two of the most faithful servants of this faith community, as they shared their leadership experiences with you, and the way that they have discerned and heard and answered God's call in this faith community as well. We also know that there are countless examples of folks throughout our history both our personal histories and our corporate histories of people who have heard and answered God's call in their lives to do or be something that perhaps they had never ever considered before. Or maybe they had been previously reticent to act upon. It is in, in both our lives and our churches in ways both large and small it is on their shoulders that we stand. It is on the foundation that they built for us that we stand. But what we haven't done so far, in spite of all that, all year, and we're already into February, what we haven't done yet is we haven't looked how, at how God has called specific people throughout Scripture to do or be something that perhaps they had never considered before or had been previously reticent to act upon. 
And that's just as important for us to talk about as anything else when we are... <clears throat> when we're having a series about calling, because we need to remember that while these people in scripture, while they have been elevated to almost hero status, they were human beings. They are the heroes of our corporate faith narrative, and yet they were folks just like us. And in the moment that they, fa they were faced with God's call on their own lives, they had what was a very, very human reaction. Every single one of them. And sometimes being reminded of that makes our own experiences just a little bit more manageable. And so that's what we're going to do over the next few weeks. We're going to get to know some of our ancestors in faith a little better. And we're going to look at what happened when they experienced God's call in their lives. And perhaps as we do, we might catch a glimpse of something that seems just a little bit familiar. Something that we might notice that seems, that rings very true to us. And as that old saying goes, we might just realize that God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the call. So let us pray. God of wisdom and righteousness, your standards and expectations of us have not changed. Fill us with the desire to know your truth and to follow your commandments. Create in us pure hearts that seek you and only you and let everything else fall away. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord our God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today, we're going to talk about Esther. Her story is one that can be very troubling at certain points. And it has not been without controversy since it was first told about 2,500 years ago. Many scholars over the years have even questioned the validity of its placement in our biblical canon, the, the, the scripture that we in the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition call our sacred text. And we will go into that in just a little while. But for now, I want to tell you Esther's story. And this, is, this retelling is with a huge assist from another pastor named Michael Williams. Long ago, in what we know today as modern Iran, there was a town called Susa, or Shushan. They're both, it's the same thing. And there lived a foolish king named Ahasuerus. And he is also known in some places as Xerxes. And he ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. One night, in the midst of a great party, and when I say great party, I mean great party. This party had been going on for six months, and that is not an exaggeration. But in the midst of this great party, King Ahasuerus called for his wife Vashti to come and dance before all of the assembled guests, wearing nothing but a crown. She flatly refused. The king considered this a horrible act of disobedience on her part, and he was outraged. And, he, and, his, and, and his advisors told him to punish her appropriately. Ahasuerus listened to them, and he banished his wife from the kingdom. But before too long, he became lonely, and he decided to take on a new queen. And so all the girls and women that were deemed the likeliest of candidates from all of the 127 provinces were brought before the king so that he might choose one who pleased him. They spent a full year in preparation to meet the king, at which point they were brought in to him one at a time. And out of what must have been at least thousands, and maybe even exponentially more, the king chose Esther. Now, a little background on Esther. She was an orphan, and she was a Jew. And she had been raised by her cousin Mordecai who was a descendant of the Jews of the Babylonian captivity and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. 
And Mordecai and Esther were part of what is known as the diaspora. And what that means, it's just, it's just Jews of the nation of Israel who live outside of the actual nation of Israel. And so they were part of the diaspora. But still, Mordecai was very proud of and devoted to his Jewish heritage. But living in the diaspora, he also knew the pitfalls of just walking around with it on his sleeve. It could be very dangerous. And so not only did he keep it a secret, but he also told Esther that she needed to keep their lineage a secret as well. Once Esther became queen, Mordecai stationed himself at the palace gates so that he could stay close to her, so he could keep an eye on her, take care of her. He was very protective. Now the foolish king elevated a wicked man named Haman to a seat of high honor, higher than any of the other nobles. And with all of that power and with his wickedness, Haman demanded that everyone, everyone, especially those at the, king, at the palace gates, whenever Haman walked by, he demanded that everybody bow to him and honor him. In fact, <coughs> excuse me, Haman was so bent on it so bent on having this happen that he actually got the king to command it. And so they all did. Everyone but Mordecai. He refused to kneel down and honor Haman. And when the others asked Mordecai why he chose to directly disobey the king's orders, Mordecai told them that it was because he was a Jew. And even though it is not, God's name is never explicitly named, the implication is that he is a Jew and only kneels before God. Well, when Haman found this out, he was absolutely furious. And he was so furious that he plotted, he, he, he launched a plot, not only just to kill Mordecai, but to wipe out all the Jews in all of the king's provinces. So he went to the king, <clears throat> And he said, you know what? There is a certain group of people who do not obey your laws. Let an edict be drawn for their destu destruction, and I will pay for it. The king agreed. And when the Jews learned of their fate, there was deep and mournful wailing. It went up all across the land. Mordecai put on sackcloth and ashes and sent his messengers to tell Esther what had happened. And that is where we pick up this morning's scripture. And I'm going to go over it again with you to continue the story. Once again from Esther 4. <clears throat> when Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa. And he gave it to him to show Esther so that it would be an explanation to her. And he told Hathak to instruct Esther to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and all of the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed and the king hasn't called for me once. 
When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house that you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther said to, <clears throat> sent this reply to Mordecai, go and gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not drink or eat for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will do the same. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Now, for those of you that know the whole story, you know that the king granted Esther's request. And not only that, she pointed the finger at Haman, who ironically was put to death on the same gallows that he built to put Mordecai to death. Now, as I mentioned before, the book of Esther can be a very troubling story at certain points. And that's because of the way the, the culture in which it was written collides with our own culture. The book can be hard for us to read, much less digest, because of so many problematic themes surrounding genocide and oppression, as well as its depiction of blatant misogyny and the exploitation of young women and girls. And while all of those controversies are relatively new, and by that I mean they've only been around for about a thousand years, the book of Esther has been causing trouble since it first appeared on the scene about 500 BCE. Why? Well, because it makes absolutely no explicit mention of God whatsoever. Only one other book in all of the Bible, the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon has that distinction. And because of all of the controversy and general frustration around the book of Esther, its inclusion in the Bible has been argued over for, well, ever since the Talmudic rabbis and all the way through John Calvin and all of his contemporaries, and they are still arguing about it. Esther is not, nor has she ever been a universally beloved biblical character. And we could spend weeks trolling the depths of all of the reasons why. There are entire seminary courses, two semesters worth, worth of, that are devoted to the complicated natures of women like Esther in the Bible and why they just baffle and frustrate and, and, and make everybody so angry. This has been going on a long time. But while it's important to know these things about the history of the book of Esther, it doesn't diminish the importance of Esther's story in discussions about calling. In fact, it may be precisely because of these things that we need to take a closer look at her. Because Esther was not perfect. It can be and has been argued over all these years that in more ways than one, she simply is incapable of standing up under scrutiny. But honestly, who among us does? Think about it. Who among us can honestly say that our lives, our behavior, our choices poured over and dissected by the scholarly and, scholarly and unschooled alike for the better part of 200 centuries would fare any better. And that's exactly why we need Esther. In more ways than we might ever want to admit, she is us and we are her. Poor choices, questionable behavior, theological limp and all. We are all one. Of course, that doesn't mean that we are hiding our ethnic heritage or that we are using our physical attributes to get our way. But it means that we've all got something. Something that we use to hold up 
and show all the world as proof that we couldn't possibly be the one that God has called to do this, that, or the other thing. It's that something that we say disqualifies us from consideration of being one of God's called. But here's the thing. While we're running around trying to convince everybody else that we are simply not qualified, and perhaps they should look to the person or to the right or the left of us, God just keeps moving forward. God doesn't pay any attention to that. Esther was an orphan with nothing to her name except pleasant looks and youth. She didn't think for herself. She had no ambition or passion. She didn't have anything she believed in. She was passive. She was obedient. She never spoke up to anybody ever. She obeyed everyone around her, and her one goal in life was to be as pleasing as possible to everybody around her. Her spirit was timid, and her voice was small. Even after she married the king of Persia, even when she was the queen of Persia, she still obeyed Mordecai and didn't question him when he ordered her to hide her true identity. She was not ever someone who anyone would expect anything from. And then her actions in the first part of this morning's scripture, they show us that all too human response that she had, right? When Mordecai demanded action from her in a situation that she neither created nor asked for, she hesitated. And then she flat out refused. Her heart went out to the Jews. She felt really bad. She didn't like that that was going to happen. But what Mordecai was asking of her could bring quick and certain death to her. She didn't want any part of it. And yet God kept moving forward. And Esther was transformed. She was transformed in the per into the person that she needed to be in order to do the thing that she needed to do at the moment she needed to do it. And even though it doesn't say this in our own biblical canon, and whether you know this or not, everything that's in our Bible has a whole bunch of other stuff written about it. Even at the time, there's so much more than just what's written in our Bible. And so in the expanded translations of the book of Esther, we are told something that we really already knew, I think. Esther's transformation didn't happen by accident or coincidence. God had been preparing Esther for such a time as this. Through all of her positive choices and all of her negative behavior, all of her happiness and all of her sorrow, every single one of her good days and every single one of her bad days, God had been using to prepare her for, as Mordecai said, such a time as this. Esther ultimately took charge of the, of the situation, not only because of who she was, but because of who God had made her to be. Now, very few of us, none of us, are ever going to find ourselves in Esther's shoes. There's very few things that I can say with absolute certainty, but I'm pretty sure that's one of them. Very few, none of us are ever going to find ourselves in Esther's shoes. But we have all been faced and will be again with the difficulty of overcoming our own selves in order to discern and then follow God's call in our lives. Sometimes we're just going to have to take a risk even go against something that we would rather be doing in order to follow God's call on our lives. Chances are that we're not even going to get to know 
anything about the step that follows the one that we're just about to take. Nothing. We just get to know, God says, stand there. He says, okay, God. And God says, I'll let you know when you take that next step. Sometimes that's all we get. And Esther knew how that felt. Mordecai probably did too. Listen again to Mordecai's response when Esther first refused his request. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And who knows if you have come to your position for such a time as this. We usually pay most attention to those last five words for such a time as this. And they're powerful words. They're worth paying close attention to. But there's something else in that last phrase that we need to take a look at. Mordecai asks, who knows? He wasn't sure. He didn't know if this was going to work out. Neither of them did, really. Neither Esther nor Mordecai knew. They knew that Esther had her position as queen, which granted her the opportunity to see the king. And they knew that God didn't want to see the Jewish people destroyed. But that's it. That's all they knew. Did that make them 100% certain that this would all work out? Who knows? There will be times in all of our lives when we have gathered all of the information we can, when we have prayed as hard as we possibly can, when we have asked for God's guidance for our next step and the one after that and the one after that, when we have done all the things that we know to do, when we have done all the things we've ever been told to do, and yet we still won't be certain. There's still that nagging question somewhere in the back of our head, that self-doubt, that uncertainty. And I would love to tell you, I would love to stand up here and tell you that that goes away all the time. Sometimes it does. But a lot of the time it doesn't. And at some point, we just have to muster the courage to move forward. Having faith that God already has done the same. In the beginning, Esther had no confidence in herself. There was no doubt in her mind that she would never be of any use to anyone for her entire life. She was sure of that. And Mordecai might have saw, thought the same thing, quite frankly. But they knew two things. They could not deny two things. Something had to be done, and Esther was the only one that could do it. Uncertain though they both might have been about Esther's ability to actually do the thing that needed to be done. But even without those answers, but even without that certainty, Esther found it within herself to step out and walk by faith. She became ready to let God determine the outcome. That poor little orphan girl with nothing to her name, timid and shy, no discernible talent, destined to be remembered as much for who and what she wasn't as much as who and what she was. And yet, in the moment that she needed to, she trusted God and did the thing that was asked of her. And she may not have ever known why. So what's holding us back? Let us pray.
patient God. We seem to think that being people of faith is somehow a campaign for your favor. We posture and we make gestures of holiness and grace, but then we easily slide back into habits of self-centeredness. Yet you have forgiven us each and every time, calling us beloved children, calling us to be a part of your work in this world. Help us to take that step, that first step that seems so very difficult, into the unknown, guided only by the sound of your voice. Help us to trust the outcome to you and let the light of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, and our beloved Savior be evident in everything that we say and think and do. Give us the confidence and the courage to truly be your witnesses all the rest of our days. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.